Hello, my name is Richard Robinson and I'm from Lead Family. Firstly, thank you for your time today. I appreciate that you have uh, hectic schedules, so I'll try and keep you engaged and inspired for the few minutes that we are uh, together. I'd like to share with you some thoughts around the power of gamification in marketing. I'm not sure if any of you are already using game-based mechanics uh, in your marketing communication strategies. If not, then I hope to provide you with a glimpse into what gamification is, how it can be used to help you get, keep, and grow customers. If you are using it, then hopefully I can provide some additional inspiration for you to take back to the office. Let me start by setting the scene a little. We are living in a world that is becoming ever more complex and unpredictable. Everything is changing from the way that we act as consumers, our needs and our expectations, in business, what our competitors are doing and even who our competitors are, and the role that technology plays within our lives. And this change is happening faster than ever. It's really quite scary to think that today will be the slowest day of change in the rest of our lives. And one thing that is abundantly clear is that what has happened in the past can no longer be extrapolated to predict the future. The last 12 months have absolutely proven that to us. And finally, as a business, we need to be more adaptable. We can no longer rely on one purpose and one operating model to survive. But what I can say is that the only certainty is uncertainty. Global growth declined in 2020 by around 5%. The current crisis is seen to be at least as three times uh, worse than the economic crisis of 2009. And the vast majority of the largest economies in the world are in recession. As I'm sure you're aware, you, and you can all relate to, the way that we interact as consumers with brands, the way that we buy products has also changed dramatically in the last 12 months. This is clearly sh shown by this data from McKinsey. In a recent global uh, consumer study that they conducted, uh, they see that 72% of consumers uh, state that they have changed stores, brands, or the way that they have shopped uh, in the last 12 months. This has happened at a scale that we've never seen before. But there's always winners, and the key winner uh, in this market has very much been e-commerce. We've seen a steady growth of e-commerce over the last decade or more, with consumers in many sectors slowly but surely moving online. However, the pace of change has changed uh, extremely quickly. We've seen e-commerce grow by over 43, uh, sorry, 34% uh, around the world uh, in the last, uh, last 12 months. Now, although this growth is impressive, it's perhaps not surprising that more people are buying more products online because of the lockdowns and the lack of a, a opportunity to go into physical stores. However, what is interesting for me is that this habit will stick. Again, quoting McKinsey Research here, uh, they found that over 90% of consumers stated that they would continue shopping uh, online even once the COVID situation had eased and shops reopened. Now, this is a dramatic change in consumer behavior. Let me give you another example. In the world of financial services, retail banks have been trying to shift consumer interactions online and away from physical branches for years, often with little success. However, 2020 has seen this change. Research by Accenture shows that at least 50% of consumers in the UK last year interacted online or via their mobile apps with their banks. And this is up from 32% in 2018. Again, these habits have changed for good. The same research shows that 46% of consumers will be willing to receive financial advice from their banks over video calls, even once branches have reopened. So things are changing and they will stay changed. As I mentioned earlier, there's a poor state of uh, uh, health in the economies of many of our uh, countries, but things are improving. For many, there's a, uh, a light at the end of the tunnel uh, in countries where we're seeing restrictions, uh, uh, lockdowns reduce and vaccine programs roll out. 47% uh, uh, of consumers are stating that they are going to start to spend more uh, 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 during 2021 to reward themselves. So we are seeing a bounce back and that will come to fruition. 
That said, things are not perfect. With changes in consumer behavior, we're also seeing changes in consumer expectations. And these expectations are pretty high. Around two thirds of consumers have stated that they're disappointed with the personalization experience that they are receiving uh, when they're interacting with brands online. In my view, we are really at a tipping point or dare I say a perfect storm for brands. The behavior of consumers has changed. Our loyalty to brands and stores has changed. Our expectations around personalization and levels of service have changed and our spending habits are about to change. So what is it that we as marketeers can do? To start to answer this, uh, I think we should uh, start with understanding what the role of marketing is. Now, there are many definitions out there, uh, and I know that each and every one of you will have your own perspective, but let me share with you what mine is. In my mind, the role of marketing is to reach customers at the moments that most influence their decisions. And we need to think broadly about what this means. This means influencing across all aspects of that consumer journey, whether that's when somebody's thinking about a product, walking into a store, trying to think of inspiration of what to eat or drink this evening, uh, or even adding something to their basket uh, or, or, or when you're on a website. I want them at each and every one of those stages to think about my brand, my product, and my company. But the challenge we face is about creating cut through. And how do we do that? I really like this quote from Loyalty360. They state that creating engaging experiences that actualize emotional bonds and drive customer loyalty is one of the best marketing strategies brands can develop. I read this to mean engage your customers in a more human and personalized way, and it will deliver results. And that truly uh, makes sense to me. So how have we been doing this traditionally? In the past, marketing has been perhaps a little bit more straightforward. You could take one message, broadcast that across the limited channels that we had available and have a pretty good understanding of your, uh, who your message uh, will reach and how many times. And there were lots of clever people out there creating economic, uh, uh, econometric models uh, to prove that your strategy was working. However, as I've already shown, things are changing. Consumers have changed. How, where, and when we consume content has changed. You don't need me to tell you that this is making our lives as marketers uh, incredibly difficult. So to combat this, we've gone down a path of precision marketing, highly focused data-driven campaigns uh, that get the right message in front of the right person at the right time. However, for this, it's still not perfect. We're reliant on the quality of data that we have to make the decisions on what to show to whom. Data regulations have changed the way that we're able to collect and use data. And we're all having to face a world without cookies as well. And coupled with this, um, there's also quite a scary side of this hyper-targeting uh, that we see in advertising. Uh, and I'm not sure about you, uh, but I'm a little bit, uh, bit scared of clowns, and uh, I don't know if you are. But let's look at some of the facts. Um, um, so how can we cut through the noise, not only getting the right message in front of the right person, but also how can we do it to incite the right action? I think some of these stats actually bring the scale of the challenge to life. We spend almost seven hours a day online, and it's worth noting this data is actually from 2019, so that's absolutely increased in the last 12 months or so. And in this time, consumers are being absolutely swamped by a tsunami of ads. But the human mind is not set up to cope with this. On average, we have an attention span of around about eight seconds, something that I'm very conscious of uh, as I'm pre uh, presenting to you today. I would suggest that we are actually forgetting to be human. Personally, I think that this is incredibly important. How to engage with people intrinsically on a human basis. I recently saw some research from IBM that stated that 80% of consumers feel that brands don't recognize them as individuals. And as I've mentioned earlier, 60% of consumers are disappointed with the level of personalization uh, that they are uh, having when they're actually uh, engaging with, uh, with brands. So how do we become more human in our marketing? 
Well, we really truly need to understand and consider what makes us human, how our brains work, how we act and how we react. I find this particular stat absolutely fascinating, that before the 21st birthday, the average human will spend more than 6,000 hours playing video games, whilst only 2,000 hours reading books. Why is this? Well, it's because game mechanics and game mechanics appeal to the way that our brain works. Uh, and uh, at Lee Family, we see that there are kind of five areas or five uh, game mechanics that are really important uh, to understand. The first one is around competition. Humans, as humans, we're hardwired to compete. And competing means against uh, somebody or something. You couple this with social aspects of competing, uh, which makes it fun and engaging. Competing is an important game metric or game mechanic and is actually the backbone of gamification. It really feeds into the subconscious, uh, subconscious and drives us to, uh, to action. The second one is very much around challenge. And let's be honest, we all love a challenge. We all love uh, uh, undertaking something that will uh, help us um, uh, really understand something and get involved, uh, get involved in it. The third area is, uh, is something called uh, mirroring. And mirroring means that uh, a person or a player gets to see how they compare with others. Now, not necessarily in a competitive way, um, but it almost in a kind of a, a like for like way. It fulfills this very, very human need that we have uh, to see where we belong, figure out how I compare within a community. The fourth uh, game mechanic that uh, is really important is around re uh, rewards. Now, rewards are really important, uh, but they certainly don't need to be monetary. Intrinsic or intrinsic, uh, extrinsic uh, rewards work well as motivators. Rewards uh, can also be simple as uh, feedback, providing insights uh, and information to people uh, that they don't uh, already know. So it can be really, really impactful. And finally, the, 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 the last key game mechanic that is important is around fun. And let's be honest, we all love uh, a bit of fun in our lives. But, and we shouldn't underestimate the value of fun um, because it is not just a frivolous thing. Uh, this is often a great value exchange with our consumers. And this is an area that we really struggle in, in marketing. It's like, how do we actually create that value exchange? In this case, they spend time with the brand, with your brand, and perhaps share some data with you. And in exchange for doing that, they're getting something back. They're doing something that is fun and enjoyable. Now, these metrics, when coupled with something called flow theory, tells us why games are so effective. Now, sorry, I'm just going to go into a little bit of science here and tell you a little bit about game uh, flow theory. Now, flow theory uh, is a concept around how we, uh, how we pay attention when we're doing something. The flow is the mental state that you experience when you are totally focused on an activity like a game. It's there that we experience feedback and the delivery of war, uh, rewards, and these rewards in chemical senses. Uh, and this, in turn, causes feel-good hormones like dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins into our brains. And this is really, really powerful stuff. Imagine just taking a small percentage of this and injecting it into our marketing and communication campaigns. This is really powerful and creates memorable moments for consumers. Uh, and I think that this quote from uh, Nicholas Babin, the former CEO of Sony Europe and a specialist in technology, innovation and gamification. Um, and he says, when games are used in a marketing context, the participant remembers the brand from a positive association and a unique experience, and that's around dopamine. And let's face it, we could all do with a little bit more dopamine in our lives right now. The other key thing around uh, games and gamification and the user game metrics uh, mechanics is that you're not being sold to. Critically, uh, these help, these mechanics help consumers believe that they've elected to participate in an experience rather than being passive or simply being marketed or sold to. This experience can feel authentic, unique, can be personalized to a particular consumer within a game, strengthening their desire uh, to be involved and increasing 
the engagement that they have with you and the time that they're spending with you uh, in, uh, uh, in any particular game. I'm often asked, where is the best place to inject gamification into your marketing plan or strategy? And if we go back to the purpose of marketing that I talked about a little earlier, which is about reaching customers at the moments that most influence their decision, then I think the answer is quite simply everywhere. Uh, you're able to use those game mechanics across the whole of that customer journey. There's no one best place to use gamification. Uh, the power of these game mechanics can be impact across all aspects of every engagement that you have with your uh, customers and with your prospects. We see those brands that reap the greatest reward from gamification use it across the full customer lifecycle, injecting game-based mechanics at every stage, whether that be to increase awareness, drive consideration, improve conversions, and ultimately uh, promote loyalty as well. Wherever you use game mechanics, you have the opportunity to surprise and delight your audience, delivering tangible impact to your business alongside that. Um, but perhaps the best way uh, to, uh, to think about this or to demonstrate this is to go through uh, a, few, uh, a few potential uh, case studies. Now, at Lead Family, we look at the customer management uh, cycle uh, in a very, very straightforward way. Uh, we turn things uh, to, uh, to help to get customers. So how do you actually get them? Uh, we then look at, well, how do you keep them, uh, which is critically important. And then finally, once you've kept them, how do you actually grow them? How do you drive additional opportunities uh, from the customers that you already have? So if we start here at the, uh, the get stage of that process, um, this covers areas from the, uh, all areas of the buying funnel, including the kind of the awareness and consideration uh, and to that initial uh, product purchase that you have. And the first example that I would like to uh, run through is with uh, a Danish furniture business called Montana. Now, Montana wanted to expand their business in new markets, raise awareness of their brands and their products across, their, uh, across those markets. A secondary goal was to capture permission data to be able to build ongoing engagement uh, with these new audiences uh, over a long period of time. So it's very much at that, uh, that top end of the, uh, of the funnel there. Now, I actually think that this is a really great example of how, um, how a brand is using gamification to achieve their goals. Uh, the format they used was a relatively simple uh, quiz format. Uh, which is great for appealing to those mirroring and competitive game mechanics that we discussed earlier. And then you couple this with rewards uh, as an a, a incentive, and it ensures that you're appealing to a consumer at a very natural uh, level. Psychologically, this is great. This, uh, this also managed to strike a balance between serious messaging and a playful tone uh, to invoke uh, uh, potential consumers to engage. The content was displayed in the game, uh, or the content displayed in the game uh, was created in exactly the same format as their overall uh, website, uh, how they position their messaging uh, through blog posts and newsletters. But in this uh, scenario, uh, the consumer was able to actually engage in the process rather than just purely consuming that content. And the game format worked incredibly well, almost to the level that it was as if uh, they were replicating like, uh, the, uh, like being in a store, seeing how furniture sits alongside each other, uh, looking at color palettes and such like. So really an immersive experience. One result that I'd like to point out that was particularly impressive uh, from this was the fact that they were able to double their uh, email permissions. Um, and uh, this was a key goal, again, in terms of that top of funnel activity about capturing information and data and actually engaging with their customers and prospects. Uh, and we all know how important permission-based data is today with all the issues surrounding around, uh, around cookie tracking and the wider GDPR uh, situation. So using games, creating that value exchange, giving something back to, uh, to the people actually engaging in those games actually inspires them to provide you with information that means that you can build a longer term, more engaging 
and more profitable both to you and to the consumer uh, relationship. The next example that I'd like to go through is uh, from Viramoda. Now, Viramoda, uh, uh, if you're not sure uh, who they are, um, they are a leading fashion brand uh, across Europe and are part of the bestseller portfolio of companies. Viramoda have uh, retail outlets, but also drive significant amounts of their sales uh, online. Now, the case that I'd like to talk through uh, now um, actually had three goals. Firstly, they wanted to promote their gene wear range. Secondly, they wanted to boost engagements with their target audience. And finally, they wanted to do this in an, uh, the most efficient and effective way possible. To do this, they designed a personality style quiz uh, where consumers answered a series of questions, both about the type and style of denim that they wear, but also more personal things such as what they do on a Saturday night, what kind of coffee they liked, those types of things are really kind of enriching that data. Based on the answers provided by the consumer, they were given a short persona profile uh, of, the, uh, of who they were, and then they were deep linked into the, um, into the relevant part of the website um, uh, uh, that suited their particular style of jeans uh, and style of gene wear that they wanted. So really quite impactful of raising awareness, highly engaging, capturing insight and data, and then driving them to uh, a particular point where they can engage with the brand more and actually make a purchase. Now, originally, Casper, uh, who ran this uh, campaign, uh, was quite hesitant about adding another step into that customer journey. Uh, as everyone uh, in digital marketing knows that uh, or, or perceives that you add an extra step, add an extra click, uh, actually reduces the conversion rate uh, with, uh, with, with that online journey. So they were very conscious about this. So the team at Viramoda uh, decided to actually run some A-B testing around this. Uh, and so what they did was they uh, set up an approach uh, where they used uh, their traditional ads that they were doing through Facebook, which leads to a landing page. And then they uh, tested that against inserting a game uh, within that flow. From their standard approach, uh, they saw an impressive five times return on advertising spend. However, when they injected gamification into it, uh, they actually saw a 30 times return on investment. So using game mechanics, engage consumers more thoroughly at the start of that journey, attracting a higher click-through rate. Uh, it meant the audience was truly opted into the process and thoroughly engaged, wanting to find uh, more uh, out more about the style, and therefore were better qualified. Viramoda saw an 8% click-through uh, on those playing the game and deep linked, linked those into uh, the website, as I mentioned. In addition, they saw an average of engagement rates of over two minutes and an incredible reduction on their cost per click for their ads um, of 50%. And this was driven by that high engagement rate of the game. So people wanting to engage within it, they had a higher click-through rate, that impacted the, uh, uh, the uh, cost per click algorithms that meant that they were actually paying far less for greater quality uh, uh, leads uh, with a, a huge amount of data sat behind it. Now, also important at the um, uh, at that stage uh, of the uh, buying cycle uh, is not only about capturing attention, but also getting people across the line to buy stuff. Uh, so what, what I wanted to do is just give you a, a very brief example of something that, again, Viramoda are doing uh, as part of this. And they're using something called luck games or high converter games to, uh, uh, to achieve this. So these games uh, really uh, play on the game mechanic of reward, fun, and competing against the game itself. In this example, Viramoda designed a beautiful slot machine game format uh, where when you clicked on the, uh, on the, machine, uh, on the game, uh, the slot spun and you had a chance of winning a discount. Really simple uh, concept, but highly effective. We do see huge engagements uh, from these types of games, and they can be really effective anywhere across the customer journey. But what I really like about this one is that it can actually be used to drive that final uh, decision to purchase. So imagine that somebody's just about to abandon uh, a basket on an online checkout. 
up pops an, uh, a, a luck game, for example, on the right-hand side here, this uh, spin the wheel uh, type game. Uh, and you spin the wheel, you play the game, and you've got a chance of actually winning uh, a discount. So what that's happening there is that stopping people uh, abandoning bar those baskets, actually shortening that sales process uh, and driving uh, more revenue in, in the immediate term. So again, Viramodo, really good example of how they're using it at that top of funnel activity and driving that get customers uh, aspect that, uh, that I mentioned uh, before. The next example I'd like to chat through is uh, from a, a really small company. Uh, they're called uh, Carbon Theory. Uh, and, uh, and this campaign uh, was titled uh, Back to Bar Campaign. Now, they're a small, innovative skincare brand based in the UK. Uh, the campaign was launched at the beginning of the very first lockdown, if you can cast your memories back that far. And the objective was to really perk up customer experience and ensure that the communications that they were showing were positive. Something that was particularly important uh, during that time, where a lot of the news was uh, and the content that we were all digesting was very, very negative. Uh, they had a tremendous response to this campaign. Uh, in fact, it turned out to be their most successful discount code campaign to date. Within 14 days of the game, uh, it drove 23,000 or more visitors to their website. The code was used uh, over 1,800 times, and they received revenue in direct sales uh, of uh, over 10,000 pounds. Now, that's pretty impressive for a, a relatively small business. A key takeout for me is that they put the customer experience first. Uh, they used a simple drop game, uh, and who would have thought that something like that would have been really quite engaging? Uh, and engaging so much that uh, people were on average spending uh, a minute and a quarter just playing the game. Uh, the campaign really played on the characteristics of competition. So you're competing against the game itself. Um, it also played on um, you know, the fun aspect of it. It's like, can I catch the right number of bars in the drop game or do I catch other things? And also tied in there with a really strong reward of a discount code. The last point um, that actually reminds me that research has shown that people who win a discount code or a voucher are 40% more likely to use it than those that are simply given a discount code. Um, so isn't that interesting? Again, it's playing on those, uh, uh, those game mechanics. I'd also like to share a little bit of a technical anecdote from, uh, from this carbon theory example. Um, they initially launched the game uh, with a registration page at the start. So before you could play the game, you had to provide some registration detail. They, as, as a result show, they saw some tremendous uh, results out of this. But what they wanted to do is actually bring this into an always on environment to so have it as an ongoing activity. So to do this, uh, what they did is they decided to move the registration page to the back of the process. And they felt that this would actually give uh, the consumers a better brand experience. So they're actually engaging with the brand before they have to provide that value exchange. Perhaps not experience, they saw an increase in the number of people playing the game. So, uh, so, and then actually going on and, and registering. So, so when deploying games, think about what the key metrics uh, you're looking for and then build accordingly to those. If you don't need to capture data, then don't do it. However, the beauty of developing games like this in our platform uh, means that you're in complete control and in charge of things. Uh, and, uh, and you can change things at, at the drop of a hat if you, uh, if you excuse that very poor pun uh, in relation to this, uh, this particular game. The next stage of that customer management journey is uh, what we call keep. So how do you keep uh, customers? We all know how important it is to keep the customers that we've got. In fact, uh, you know, uh, research shows that it's five times more expensive to actually get a new customer than it is actually to keep one. So why we're not spending more time and more effort doing that, uh, I, I really don't know. I've got a couple of examples I want to run through uh, that, that show companies that are actually doing this. The first example is with Aldi, the supermarket chain. Uh, now, Aldi in Denmark wanted to grab the attention of their audience and re-engaged uh, lapsed and low-engaged customers. As you know, grocery shopping tends to be quite fickle 
Research shows that 83% of us have visit up to nine different grocery chains each year. So capturing a greater share of that wallet is incredibly important uh, strategy for, uh, for those in, in this part of retail. In this example, Aldi used a spot the difference game, which promoted the feel for summer and for holidays. The game was promoted organically through their social media uh, pages and also via email, again, with the aim to re-engage uh, existing customers that had lapsed or were low engagement. The campaign used uh, key uh, mechanics, including being a challenge, uh, being a competition, and actually being fun, and of course, gaining a reward. Uh, and talking of which, the reward for this one was uh, actually uh, to win a great big box of uh, a box of uh, ice cream. Uh, and for me, that's, uh, that, that's a pretty good incentive, I have to admit. The results were really impressive. Uh, within the first 10 days, uh, they had achieved over 15,000 unique game plays, uh, with consumers spending on average a minute and a half engaging with the game and the brand. When compared with engagement rates around, of around one, per, uh, one second uh, for display ads, you can really see the benefit uh, there is in doing gamification uh, for that engagement metric. This also led to 74% of those that have played the game uh, actually going on and making a purchase uh, with, um, uh, with Aldi. So really, really impactful for that those uh, slightly less engaged and lapsed customers. The next example I'd like to uh, walk through is uh, from ZZ. Now, ZZ are a uh, leading European uh, fashion brand, uh, and they were launching a new swimwear collection, uh, and they ran a gamification activation to boost loyalty and drive uh, uh, activity around this. Uh, and they used a, a very simple scratch card uh, style game. The activity ran over several markets, and uh, the key traffic, key traffic driver uh, being organic social media uh, and focusing uh, primarily through Facebook and Instagram stories, their newsletter, email activity, that type of thing. The aim was to increase engagement uh, and the acquisition of dormant social media followers and drive members to their membership uh, uh, program. The results were remarkable. Uh, they were able to capture 77,000 new uh, email registrations and convert almost 6,000 uh, new uh, people, uh, sorry, almost 8,000 new uh, members uh, to their membership club. And that's, again, really key for them. They wanted to capture more information and then create this, uh, this loyalty, this uh, ongoing engagement, which they achieved. Um, and if these results were not um, impressive enough, the program also drove uh, a huge amount of additional revenue. In fact, 415,000 euros of sales in the first month of the activity. And in anyone's book, that is pretty huge. They focused on the consumer experience first, creating content that allured people in and pulled them through a journey rather than that blasting broadcast push approach that uh, we often use making the consumer feel that they were, had elected to spend time with the brand through the intrigue uh, that's created around the content versus putting out a blunt sales message. As mentioned, the results speak for themselves. Now, the final stage of this uh, customer journey, customer management journey that we talk about uh, is uh, around grow. So uh, how do you grow existing customers? Now, this is hugely important part of the market, of marketing and one that's often ignored. However, I was really pleased to see that this is changing. Uh, a recent study by Gartner showed that 72% of CMOs state that they'll be focusing uh, their time uh, on actually uh, trying to grow, um, grow customers, grow existing customers uh, and business uh, rather than necessarily going out and collecting new ones. Now, the first example I'd like to run through in this section is uh, from Co-op, uh, and this is uh, Co-op in Denmark, and they uh, were really focused around uh, loyalty and retention. Retention. It's a critical part of any supermarket chain uh, strategy. Uh, anyone that knows companies like Tesco's uh, and the amount of money that they've invested into loyalty programs uh, understand the importance in this particular sector. For Co-op, uh, a critical part of their strategy was to develop a mobile app. When they initially developed uh, the app uh, two or three years ago, uh, it successfully launched uh, with good levels of downloads. However, Co-op felt that 
it could be improved. Alongside this, they realize that the value of a mobile app is not just downloading it, but the usage of it. To increase the value uh, of the app to its customers, they decided to uh, make it more of a destination site, offering member-only content and special offers. And a core part of this strategy was to inject game mechanics into the heart of that app. They decided to use uh, game mechanics on both fronts, so increasing downloads and also engagement. They initially promoted the game elements, uh, game mechanic elements via uh, uh, social media, uh, and actually using uh, the games themselves or the incentives of the games themselves as a, a, a real driver to get people to uh, to um, uh, download the app. Now let's move to some of the results on this, and, and the, the results were immediate and incredibly impressive. Um, in, in one month, they saw an additional 95,000 uh, app downloads. Uh, they also saw that uh, 700,000 people played those games, a total of 3.5 million times. Now, one of the key mechanics that co-op uses within the apps uh, is also to drive people uh, into their store. So how this, this works is, uh, as a consumer, uh, you play a game. If you're successful, you win a voucher or a discount code or even a free sample, which you're able to go and redeem in your local store. In the first year of, uh, of using gamification in the app, Corp saw over 10 million gameplays and over 1 million samples being picked up in store. I mean, that's an additional 1 million visits to your stores, which is really, really quite impressive. But the engagement is impressive, but the Real results uh, are the impact that you can see on the business. As you can see from this slide, Co-op ran pre and post uh, use of gamification analysis. Uh, and what the data told them, that those individuals that play games in the app increase their frequency of visiting the store by 58%, and also increase their basket size in each of those visits by 33%. So just by using game mechanics, to engage uh, individuals. Driving them with a good reward into store has a tremendous impact. Today, we're seeing that, um, uh, that uh, co-op are launching uh, up to two games uh, per week on their mobile app, often in partnership with brands such as Carlsberg or Oreo or Twix, all brands driving significant value, uh, both to, uh, to co-op uh, and the consumers. These games are achieving hundreds of thousands of gameplays, engagement times, in some cases over four and a half minutes, and price collection rates of in excess of 70%. In this example, Co-op also analyzed the impact of sales of Twix chocolate bars pre and post the gamification campaign. Sales of Twix rose amongst Co-op shoppers from one and a half percent pre gamification to almost 16% after the campaign. These figures show the everyday impact of uh, gamification. Now, the final example I want to run through uh, is slightly different. Um, it's from a sector where you think that loyalty and retention is almost uh, to be given, uh, and that's the football clubs. Uh, although looking at what's happening in uh, some of the European leading uh, football clubs in the last week or two, perhaps uh, football fans' loyalty has been stretched a little bit far. Anyway, this example is from uh, Willem Svey, uh, the Dutch top league uh, football club. The club wanted to create some buzz around their summer 2000 release of their new shirt, their new kit. Uh, and they wanted to do this in a unique and creative way uh, with the ultimate aim of selling more replica kit. Um, and so what they did is they, uh, using social media, they, the club tweeted that their captain, Jordan uh, Peters, uh, had left the club. Fans were shocked because they thought he'd actually transferred to another club. But what happened by playing a series of games, four games in total, the, um, the <clears throat> fans could actually uh, find out the location of, uh, of Peters. Uh, so almost like a real life scavenger hunt. Within the first uh, couple of hours uh, of the game going live, uh, 27,000 fans or more visited the site, site to participate. One lucky fan uh, followed the trail and actually found Peters, and he was located outside the uh, uh, the uh, the offices of the main sponsor uh, of the uh, of the football club, uh, with the keys to the new shop, uh, uh, the, the club store in his hands. Uh, and so 
uh, there was an opening of the uh, of the store and a re uh, revealing of the new kit. So really quite an impactful, playful, but very engaging uh, mechanism. In addition to the uh, 27,000 fans that, uh, that play the game uh, in the first couple of hours, 6,500 fans actually provided their registration information, their email address that they'd never provided before. And time of interacting with the brand was uh, in excess of three minutes. The ultimate aim was to sell shirts, uh, and they did this by the bagful. In fact, sales of their new shirt were 500% or more up on the last kit launch that they did. So again, providing dramatic uh, impact, uh, even on the most loyal of fans. So why have I spent the last 20 minutes or so uh, talking to you uh, about uh, gamification in marketing? Well, at Lead Family, uh, we are a software as a service company, and we've developed a platform that enables marketers to create, build, and execute online games to support their business and marketing objectives. Our platform has over 30 concepts or templates built in, taking out any requirement for coding. You simply choose the game format that meets your objective, add your own creative to develop a completely bespoke look and feel, and then push the game out via your execution channels, whatever that be. It may be your website, via email, social media feeds, or through advertising. All the game examples that I've gone through today have been developed by marketing teams of our customers. Our team is very consultative. We're here to help at every step of the journey, but the control flexibility, agility, agility even, is very much uh, in your hands. Drawing my presentation to a close, I'd like to leave you with a, uh, a few points uh, uh, that, that, that I've taken out. Uh, the first one is that uh, engaging your customer is more challenging now than ever before. You need to be able to cut through the noise to be able to get their attention. Although marketing conditions and marketing approaches change, the human brain doesn't. As marketers, we need to understand what makes our customers tick and engage them in the most effective way. And finally, gamification can provide beautiful, highly engaging ways to communicate with your audiences across the whole of that customer journey, um, helping you to get, keep, and grow your customers, demonstrating everyday business impact. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Uh, my contact details are here, but I'm very happy to take uh, uh, any questions that you have now and, uh, and respond to any of those. Um, so yes, if there, uh, if there are any, uh, any questions coming through. Okay, I seem to have absolutely uh, covered every point and topic around gamification in marketing and the power that that brings to your marketing uh, that, uh, that I've stunned you all into silence. So, uh, um, so if there aren't any questions, um, I'd like to uh, say thank you very much indeed for your attention. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to spend a few minutes with you today. Uh, my contact details are on the slide. Feel free to, to reach out or to, uh, to go to our website. Uh, where we've got lots of uh, additional case studies that you can uh, you can look at uh, and you can read, and uh, uh, and lots of additional information that uh, really helps you understand how gamification can really empower you as marketers and again bring everyday business impact to your organisations. Uh, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>